I'm a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Arizona and the head of the psychology department. Um, and it's been a long time since we've been here giving talks through the College of Science. Uh, it's just wonderful for all of us to be back in person and to be able to see some old faces and, and meet lots of new people as well, so, so welcome. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce our guest speaker, my friend and colleague, Dr. Mary Frances O'Connor. Uh, Mary Frances is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at U of A, and she's the director of the Grief, Loss, and Stress Lab, or the GLASS Lab. Um, Mary Frances is homegrown, so she got her PhD at the University of Arizona in uh, the psychology department, and she went from there to UCLA and became a faculty there at the uh, Cousins Center for Psychoneuroimmunology. But we lured her back here in 2012. Uh, to become, to take her place uh, in psychology as a faculty member, and, and we're really delighted to have her with us. Um, Mary Frances is the leading expert in the, this relatively new scientific field of study of grief, um, and in particular, understanding the brain mechanisms that mediate grief, and if you want to understand grief, you want to un understand loss and love. Um, in fact, she was the first person to ever think about studying the brain uh, in the context of grief. And she did those first studies using functional MRI, which I think she'll talk about a little bit tonight, at the University of Arizona when she was a graduate student. Um, her new book is The Grieving Brain. If you haven't seen it, it's up there. I've got one with, I carry it with me wherever I go. Uh, the Surprising Science of How We Learn from Loss and Love, and it's published by Harper One, and, and it came out less than a year ago. And this book is really groundbreaking. It, it focuses on a topic that is as fundamental to the human condition as it is socially difficult to discuss, and that's the death of a, uh, of a loved one. Um, it touches all of us, it's meaningful, it's uh, important to, to talk about. And in this book, Mary Frances really weaves this wonderful story of this no, new science, the neuroscience of grief, with her own experiences and her personal journey of love and loss. The, the response to this book has been overwhelming. Um, Mary Frances has literally been asked to give talks all over the world on this topic. And I've been uh, fortunate enough to be at a few of those events, just a few, um, uh, both at, as a listener, but also as a, an interviewer and as a moderator. And I can tell you that Mary Frances is not only a very gifted writer, but she's an amazing speaker. So we're really pleased to have her here tonight, and please welcome Dr. Mary Frances O'Connor. Well, it is a delight to be here with all of you tonight, and I just really want to thank the University of Arizona College of Science, who put this together, and the the community at Saddlebrook who are hosting us tonight. It's uh, just a marvelous space. I had not been to this auditorium before, so I'm just delighted to be here with you this evening. This evening, I'm going to talk with you about the neurobiology, the neuroscience of grief. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of a roadmap for what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna start with that idea of neuroscience as maybe one lens on grief and grieving. And neuroscience may not be the first thing you think of when you think about grief and grieving. And I'm not even convinced that it's the only way to look at grief and grieving. But the reality is that neuroscience is the conversation of our times. And I think the most important part is for us to talk about our experiences of grief and grieving, to really understand what each of us is going through, which often helps us to feel a lot more normal about the experience. We're gonna talk about the idea that grieving could be thought of as a form of learning, and that thinking of it that way can make it feel more approachable, that it may not be so scary in that we've all been learning from the beginning. 
we're going to talk about the fact that in order to understand grief, we really have to understand love and bonding. And that means even at the level of the brain, we have to understand what happens with love when we fall in love with our one and only? What happens in the brain in order to understand then what might change? I want to talk with you a little bit about the difference between grief and grieving, which became apparent to me as I was doing studies, but I have found that other people have benefited from thinking about them distinctly. And finally, something that gets in the way when we grieve, uh, as, as looking at this as a form of learning, it can be helpful because it also can help find places that we might be getting stuck. When I try to explain about the neurobiology of grief, I like to start with a story. And for the story to work, you have to go along with me there's a premise, you have to just go with me. And the premise is that your dining room table has been stolen. I'm not sure why your dining room table has been stolen, but it's irrelevant to the story. And so you wake up one night and you get out of bed, you realize you're thirsty. It's sort of half dark in the house. And so you're going to the kitchen to get a glass of water, so you go down the hall, and you cross to go toward the kitchen, and just as you bump into where the table should be, you feel something. You feel its absence. You feel the space where it should be. And this is a very difficult thing for a neuroscientist to explain. We understand all about peripheral nerves and sensation and how that goes to the brain and then how your brain understands the object. But the idea that you would feel an empty space is a very difficult thing for us to understand. And by the same token, I think you can imagine the fact that when a loved one has been stolen from us, we carry that absence with us. And in fact, people will often say, you know, no one mentions my loved one, but for the person who's grieving, they should be in the room. We, as a grieving person, are experiencing the whole where they are. And the fact that that can disconnect us from people around us can be very isolating as an experience. The idea that we might be able to feel something that is missing is not entirely just a metaphor. I want to tell you about a study uh, about object cells, which are cells specifically neurons in the brain. And this is actually Nobel laureate work by Maybit, May, Maybrit Moser and Edvard Moser. And they came up with this idea of having uh, rodents, rats, and they took a rat each day and put him in this little black box. Now this is an incredibly boring black box. The only thing that is interesting about this black box is that there is a blue Lego tower in it. Needless to say, the rat pays a lot of attention to the blue Lego tower. Now in this next picture here, you can see that actually the rat shows up on some days before the Lego tower has appeared, then on days when the Lego tower is present, and then afterwards, after the Lego tower has been taken away. And you can see here, this is the, the rat running around uh, a trace of where they're going. Of course, before the object is there, the object cells are not firing. When the Lego tower is present, these object cells are firing. These specific neurons are firing in the brain. And then, of course, after the Lego tower has been taken away, they're not firing anymore. So far, this seems fairly straightforward. But what's interesting to note is it actually takes up to 11 days for those neurons to stop firing. And so you can see that on after the day zero, the day the Lego tower is taken away, and for many days after, when the rat is in the spot where the Lego tower should be, these object neurons are firing. I find this to be absolutely phenomenal. The, the trace 
of this object is still visible in the firing patterns of the brain. Now, this is a Lego tower. I mean, it's interesting, but how important can it really be to the rat? So I think on the other hand, when loved ones are missing, think about how long it must take our neurons to update, to understand that this one who is supposed to be there is missing at the breakfast table, in the garage, when you're going to the store, all of those moments when our loved one is supposed to be there, our neurons are still firing. And in fact, I receive email pretty frequently since the book uh, was published. Um, wonderful people who are reaching out because uh, something I said in the book really touched them. And I just want to read this to you. It's not long, but it really, I think it made the point maybe even better than I can. Last Thursday morning, I walked through the backyard for the first time in months. I passed the remains of last year's annuals, browned in their clay pots on the patio, husks of mums and rosemary I never bothered to clear away last fall. Plants Phil took care of. Just beyond them is his perennial garden, filled with rose bushes, lavender, and other treasures he doted on. It was blanketed in dead gray leaves, and I crouched for a minute to look for signs of life. Rooting around in that leaf litter, I uncovered two unexpectedly lush green swaths, ice plants that have somehow flourished despite the lack of attention. There you are, I thought. Of course, I wasn't just thinking about the plants. After Phil died, I often had no words in my head at all, just a storm of feeling. But when I did think in words, they were usually, where are you? I thought those words to myself all the time when making lunch for one or sorting through his clothes or seeing his eyes gaze out at me from a framed photo. It's not that I ever doubted he was gone, but on some level, I just could not make sense of it. Lately, I've been reading a book called The Grieving Brain which discusses how rodents possess a sort of internal GPS system in their brains, devoted to not just their own place in their environment, but in relation to other rodents as well. Scientists believe these discoveries have human applications and may help to explain the disorienting nature of grief. When a loved one has been wiped off the map, yet the neurons keep firing despite their target being absent, that is grief. So this moment of finding these plants alive and well after two seasons of being suffocated by cold and dark and neglect, it was big because I finally felt a piece of Phil in the living and breathing world after seven months of feeling him nowhere at all. I think there are so many pieces of what she describes that we can relate to. And I want to unpack for you a little bit how I think the brain is involved in the things that she's describing there. And I said it at the beginning of the talk, but I want us to think for a minute that grieving could be thought of as a form of learning. Think about all of those habits that you have to relearn, right? The habits of putting laundry in, in the drawer of the person, of remembering that you don't have to shop for the soy milk because your loved one who can't drink regular milk isn't there. All of those tiny habits that have to be updated. But learning in a bigger sense as well, what does it really mean that this person is gone? What does that mean for my life? If I had planned to retire with this person and she's died, what am I gonna do during retirement? What does that even look like now? And so thinking of it as learning enables us to go from the very small to the very big problems that we face when we have to deal with the death of a loved one. But here's the interesting thing for me. Human beings are actually pretty good at learning, it turns out. 
When I teach a class, I teach a psychology of death and loss class in a big lecture hall, sort of like this, and you know, you get used to which students sit where, right? They always sit in the same place, don't they? And so you think, ah, there's the student who always knows the answer, and there's the student who talks all the time, and there's the, you know, and you get used to sort of who they are. And then at the end of the semester, of course, they all leave, and the next semester, a different group of students comes in. And I'm never surprised by this. I never think, where are they, right? Because I'm not bonded to them. They are not my one and only. And so the encoding that my brain does of who those students are, much as I like them, don't get me wrong, it's not the same as having a bonded relationship with them. And so the challenge for me is, what is it about this that makes grieving take so long? Grieving takes longer, usually than most of us are ever anticipating that it will. Grieving usually feels very different than what we are expecting. I think that I have come to at least a theoretical reason as to why grieving might take so long. And that is, for the brain, our loved one is gone and everlasting at the same time. So here's a crazy thing about the brain. The brain can actually listen to two streams of information at the same time, even when those two streams of information can't both possibly be true. So, for example, you might have a memory of being there at the bedside when a loved one died, or getting that terrible phone call telling you that, that a loved one has died, or being at a funeral. All of these memories mean that you can refer in your head, in your brain, to the fact that the person has died. As she says in the quote here, it's not that I ever doubted he was gone. But at the same time, there is an attachment belief with our one and only that says, you will always be there for me and I will always be there for you. And importantly is the word always. Now, there's a very good reason why we have this belief, why this belief is so important to us that it actually ensures our survival. And the reason is, in order to understand grief, we first have to understand bonding and attachment. So we know that this bonding that we do with our one and only is actually something that's evolutionarily conserved even from very, uh, very different social mammals. So I want to tell you a little bit about these little rodents called voles. Prairie voles, which in this picture look like the size of bears, but, <laughs> but they're little rodents that run around all over North America. These little voles pair bond for life. That is to say, when they first meet their one and only, when they fall head over heels in love with this specific other vole, it actually causes changes in the epigenetics of the nucleus accumbens of their brain. It is because of this specific vole that those proteins are folded differently in the brain. This would not happen if I hadn't met this vole. It actually means that the stamping of what they look like and how they smell and what they do becomes a part of our brain. Interestingly, once that bond has been set up, separation from that mate causes decreased oxytocin binding to receptors in that same brain region. Once you've become a we and you separate these two voles, there is an immediate response in terms of the hormones and chemicals in the body. You're a we now, and when you're separated, it means something is missing. What's fascinating about this is that it looks very similar in humans. So this is why this is so important. 
I recently went on a trip with my partner to London and we, we love London, uh, my, half my family is British, and so we're traveling around in London, and we very conscientiously made a plan. What if, you know, one of us gets on the tube and the other one doesn't make it? How are we gonna get back together again, right? It turns out we're gonna go to the closest local Starbucks because they have Wi-Fi. Anyway, <laughs> but the point is that we are so concerned with reuniting with our loved ones that we came up with a very specific plan. You couldn't go to work every day. You couldn't send your children off to school every day, which is really important, if you didn't have this deep belief that you would all be reunited again at the end of the day. It would be way too anxiety provoking. And so attachment bonds are these invisible tethers that keep us coming back to each other. It is a way that we can explore and also have the safety and security of bonded relationships. What this means is, my loved one doesn't have to be in my physical presence. I don't have to be able to see my loved one for me to believe that they are out there. For me to believe that they will do their darndest to come and find me if we're separated. And that I will do my best to find them if we are separated. So here's the problem. Our brain has a solution to our loved one not being present. Go get them. But the challenge is, if a death happens, which luckily doesn't happen very often, the brain doesn't know what to do with that information. It continues to want us to go and find them. And in fact, you may have heard people describe the idea they may be in a crowd and they think that they see their loved one. I had a young woman tell me that she found herself, she was always looking for her father whenever she was in a group of people. And she said, I feel crazy. And I said, that's just how it works. That's just how attachment neurobiology works. It's motivating you to try and find them. The brain is really a prediction machine. Its role for us is to take thousands of days of experience and try and predict what might happen next. Does this pretty darn well. We get around pretty darn well. So think of it this way. If you have woken up for thousands and thousands of mornings with your wife or your husband next to you, and you wake up one morning and they're not there, it's actually not a very good prediction that they've died, right? And what that means is that for the brain, for a while, it's like they haven't. That it takes time for the brain to have new experiences, to, to see those plants that die because Phil isn't watering them, to have that experience of going through the holidays without this person, to have all of these experiences to learn what it means that they're gone. And so, when we think about human attachment bonds, we can think about these voles, and here's something I find fascinating. So I mentioned the nucleus accumbens in this slide. For those of you who are brain region junkies, it's in the uh, ventral striatum, which is in the basal ganglia. What's fascinating is, in a study that I did of people who had lost a loved one, I asked them to come into the lab and show me a photo of the person who had died. And I scanned that photo, and when they were in the fMRI scanner, I could then show it to them on goggles. And I could compare their brain activation in response to the grief they felt over this deceased loved one with um, their response to, say, a picture of a stranger, just how the brain responds to another human being that it's not bonded to. The brain uses all of these neurochemicals to make these attachment bonds, these invisible tethers, work. It uses dopamine and opioids and oxytocin to reward us for reuniting with our loved ones. And the reward learning for this attachment behavior happens with neurochemicals in this specific basal ganglia region. Here's a fascinating finding. 
We can take pictures of uh, infants and show them to their mothers. That's the first study. We can take pictures of kindergartners and show them to their fathers. That's the second study. And we can take pictures of a romantic partner and show them to the partner. And we find this same region, the same neighborhood of regions activated with all of those bonded relationships. And here's the fascinating part. It's the same area, it's in the same neighborhood as what the voles have changes in when they bond with their one and only. This is data, which is great. But for me, there is another important aspect to it. For me, I find it comforting that our brain is forever physically shaped by our loved one. It is because you loved this person and they loved you that your brain has particular firing patterns, that your brain has these folded proteins in a particular way. And for me, that feels a little like, even though they're not physically on this mortal plane anymore, I'm still carrying a piece of them with me because that physical aspect of my brain would look different if it weren't for this person, for this relationship that I had. And I find that to be both amazing and comforting. In this MRI study, this region of the brain called the nucleus accumbens that you can see here, that is actually my Nana. <laughs> this is a, it's not a picture of me, but it is a picture of my Nana. And that's the type of photo we would have shown in the MRI scanner. And you can see this nucleus accumbens region that's lit up there. And by lit up, I don't literally mean a light bulb goes off. I mean that there are neurons firing in this region. And what's fascinating is, before we did the neuroimaging studies, we brought this, these folks into the lab and did interviews with them first to ask them about what was your experience like of losing this person? What happened? when you were caring for them, what happened when they died, and what has happened since. In those interviews, we asked them very specifically about how much they were yearning for the person who had died. And the fascinating piece is, those who were having more difficulty adjusting to the death of a loved one, they actually showed more activation in this region and we discovered that the activation in this region, which you can see here on this side of the graph, so more activation in the region up here, correlated with their self-report of how much yearning they were having for the person who died, which is down on this column here, with greater yearning being on this side. So there was a correlation there. What's important is that level of activation, it didn't correlate with the amount of time had passed since the death. It didn't correlate with other negative feelings people were having. It specifically correlated with that yearning, that wanting to be back with the person. This study was done in 2008, and I will say I watched desperately in the literature for replication. <laughs> and I'm so delighted to say that this year, we have a study that came out in biological psychiatry looking at brain networks specifically in older adults in late life grief. This was 65 older adults who had lost their spouse, lost their spouse in the previous 13 months. And in this study as well, their self-report of yearning was positively correlated between this nucleus accumbens region and other regions of the brain. I think we are still in the infancy of understanding the neurobiology of grief, but when I see these sort of converging pieces of evidence, it gives me hope that we're at least on the right track. I want to shift gears just a little bit. If you were listening really closely, you may have heard that I use the term grief and I use the term grieving, and I don't actually mean the same thing. Grief is that feeling that just overwhelms you. As uh, the woman in the quote described, just a storm of feeling. 
it can have a lot of different elements to it, but it is that wave that overtakes you. And you may think, I'm not even gonna get through this moment. Grieving, on the other hand, is the way that grief changes over time, even though grief never goes away. So grief is just the natural response to being aware of something so important that is gone. And one is going to experience grief if something very important has been stolen from you you're going to feel grief forever when you are in a moment where you're aware of it. But grieving means that that same grief, it may become less intense or less frequent, or it may even just, well, the first hundred times you have that wave of grief and you think, I'm not even gonna get through this moment. The hundred and first time, it may feel equally bad, but you may think, I know what this is. This is familiar. And eventually, you may learn how to find comfort in that moment, how to reach out in that moment, or a whole host of strategies that you might use to manage the fact that you are now a person who has grief. What's important to me is that grieving, that natural process that we go through, it doesn't mean there's an end to grief. And I'll give you an example. My sister got married a couple of weeks ago, which was wonderful. And on that day, neither of my parents were able to be there, having both of them passed away previously. And of course, on that day, we're sitting at dinner, and we had a moment, you know, thinking about how they should be here. The fact that we felt grief in that moment doesn't mean there was anything wrong with our grieving. It doesn't mean we had done anything wrong up to that point. Grief is not proof that you haven't been doing grieving right. Right? It's just a natural human emotion when you become aware of what you've lost. And so I think this is helpful for a few reasons. For one thing, I realized when I was doing these neuroimaging studies that I was actually studying grief. But a lot of my scientific questions had to do with grieving. And so in the moment, I was measuring that wave of grief they were having in the scanner looking at the photograph. But in order to measure grieving, I would need to have them come back multiple times to see how things had changed over time for them. There are not many studies that have done that yet, um, and perhaps none of them done it the rigorous way I would like. But we do have other studies where we interview people many times after the death of a loved one. So they're not in the neuroimaging scanner, but we're doing those interviews with them, asking them about what their grief experience is like. What are their grief symptoms or grief severity like? I want to talk to you about this term, prolonged grief disorder. I've just said, grief is natural. Grief isn't going to go away. And yet, the DSM, and previous to that, the International Classification of Disease Diagnoses, which is put out by the World Health Organization, that's a mouthful, each of these bodies has accepted into their diagnostic books prolonged grief disorder. And so many people feel like, well, how can it, you just said it isn't gonna go away, so how can it be prolonged, right? I think this particular study really helps me to explain how the trajectory of grieving can look different in different groups of people. So I'm gonna use my, yep, I think you can see my cursor there. So this blue line, and of course the line actually goes sort of up and down, but if you take an average across many months, this is zero, six, 12, 18, and 24 months. And this is the level of grief severity that a person is experiencing, so this is more intense grief up here. The most common reaction to the death of a loved one 
is to, of course, have grief and for that grief to decline over time. Now, notice there isn't even zero on the scale, right? It does, it's not that it goes away, but you can see a very clear pattern here of a change over time. This is over 66% in this particular study, and this has been replicated many times. This is our most common response to the death of a loved one. There's another response in this green line, which can be a very intense grief response after the death of a loved one. And here again, you see this change over time, this decrease in the experience of symptoms, the frequency, the intensity, or even just learning how to manage episodes of grief better. That particularly intense grief often happens when a death is very unexpected. And it means that if someone has a heart attack, if someone has an accident, there was just no forewarning for the brain, and we have a very acute response. But even with that acute response, we see this natural trajectory. Now, the group of people that clinicians worry about are this chronic group that's in red. We've used a lot of different terms in the first couple decades as we've been trying to understand what does it mean to have chronic grief. So we've used a bunch of terms. In this case, I'm using chronic grief and prolonged grief interchangeably. What's so notable about this red line, even though there's a lot of variation in how people are feeling, is there's just no change over time. The level of symptoms that people are experiencing is like what they were experiencing right after the person died. And that, to me, is not the natural reaction to loss. What's also important is, at the beginning here, it's really hard to tell who's gonna be in what trajectory. We're all having a tough time early on. But round about a year, you can see that these lines have really started to separate. And so we don't even think about diagnosing prolonged grief disorder until a year after the death has happened. And it's not because of how they're feeling at that moment, but because how they are now may predict how they're going to be in the future. And the great news is we have targeted psychotherapy that can help people to develop skills to get back on that natural trajectory. So, in the context of a supportive therapeutic relationship, there are ways to try and learn how to manage those waves of grief, to manage the relationships that you have that may have changed a great deal because of the death of this loved one, or even to discover the things that you're really avoiding, and avoiding can really prevent you from learning what is life like now. Another thing that gets in the way when we're grieving is something called the would've, should've, could've. The would've, could've, should've are thoughts in psychobabble, we call these intrusive thoughts, and they're very common after a traumatic event or after the death of a loved one. These are thoughts you don't want to have, but they just keep coming back to you, even though you may be trying not to have them. You're sitting at the stoplight, and suddenly you're thinking about how this would have gone differently if the doctor would only have, or if only I could have gotten them to the hospital sooner, or they should have known not to have that last drink, or whatever it is. The reason that these, and I will say intrusive thoughts like other grief symptoms, for most of us decline over time naturally. Perhaps in part as we tell the story of what happened, which many of us want to do, we come to understand what has happened. But the reason that the would have, could have, should have thoughts can be so problematic if we stay stuck in them in the long term comes about, well, you can think of it this way. Think of each of those stories I just told, you know, if only I could have gotten them there to the hospital sooner. Each of those stories we're making up, each of them ends in, and then my loved one would have lived. 
but the painful reality is they didn't live. And you can make up an infinite number of these stories, but in fact, we have to understand what is the present reality, even when it is painful. A fellow I know in Tucson whose son died by suicide told me about the would have, could have, should have thoughts. And he said that he discovered eventually that he couldn't go through those thoughts to finding an answer, that he had to find a way to go around those thoughts. And I think one of the reasons that this type of intrusive thoughts, if we get stuck in these stories, can really be problematic for us is because they keep us from living in the present moment. And the present moment may be full of human suffering, but it is also the only place where you can see the puppy loping in the park or the really sweet smile that the barista gives you for no particular reason or the really important story your grandson is trying to tell you. If we're stuck in our head in something in the past, it prevents us from really living in the moment. And in the moment, there are negative feelings, but there are positive feelings too. For many of us, human beings are quirky. It turns out you can't just turn off the negative feelings. If you turn off the negative feelings, you just turn off feelings. And then you can't feel any of the good feelings either. And many people will describe the experience, it's like I'm just going through the motions. And this often is because they're trying to avoid the experience of feelings because they know that there are painful feelings there. There is a way in which perhaps if we don't think of it so much as my grief, but we think of it as human grief, it enables us actually to find a way to connect with someone else in a moment when something's been stolen from us. Because it turns out we have family members, we have neighbors, we have ancestors who have been through terrible loss as well. And they may have ways of coping that we could learn, or they may have ways to just comfort us in that moment that feels really good. And so living in the present moment is a way for us to learn what is life like now and how do I go about restoring a meaningful life while carrying the absence of this person with me. For me, the question is maybe different than we've been asking. So if we take seriously the perspective of the brain, then the question that we ask those are who are grieving might change. Perhaps instead of, how are you doing? We might ask, what has changed since your loss? What are you learning as a way to open that conversation? I want to thank the many people who make all of this research possible, many of them the fine graduate students that you see who spend hours in the lab analyzing data, and also agencies that support my research, of course the College of Science, and all of you for listening. Thank you very much. We have a good 10, 15 minutes. I'd be delighted to take some questions. It's always as interesting to me what you want to know. Now we do have a microphone, so we'll go here first. And you just have to pause with me while we let the microphone get to you. And it gives me a chance to have a drink of water. Just over here. Can you raise your hand again? Thank you. Test, test. Good evening. Hello. Can you talk a little bit about disenfranchised grief? Ah, absolutely. It's a, it's a topic near and dear to my heart. So I've talked about grief in a very individual way. Disenfranchised grief means that the, that the stories that society is telling us are the people around us. The story is, Eh, this isn't really grief. 
eh, you shouldn't be this upset about it. And often that is associated with very specific losses. So for example, the loss of an ex-spouse, the loss of a father who was alcoholic and really made your life pretty hard, uh, the loss of someone you've had an affair with, the loss of a colleague or a mentor whom you are just bereft about in a way that you can't explain. All of these are considered disenfranchised in the sense of we don't sort of, as a society, give you the right to grieve these. It can also be about what the death how the death happened. So the stigma around death by suicide or death by drug overdose as though the grief that people experience isn't as real. And of course we know whenever a bond is broken, that grief is real, regardless of what the, the name for the person was. My father was widowed for a very long time. My mother died when I was 26. And he sort of uh, gathered all the widowers in my hometown and used to make them dinner because none of them knew how to cook and stuff. And uh, he developed an incredibly close friendship with one of these men. And when that best friend died, I saw grief that I had not seen in my father since my mother died. And so I think, you know, for most of the people in my hometown, there was no expectation that my father would take time away, that my father wouldn't show up at church because of what he was feeling, because it was just a friend. And so I think that's maybe what you're referring to with disenfranchised grief, and it's so important to think about. Another question? Yes, down in the front here. Um, the prolonged grief slide indicated that yes. about one out of 10, mm -hmm. but then the chart next to it indicated yeah. about 25% were acute. Can you just clarify? You are such a good data, data head, we'd you, say at school. Much. I'll tell you why. <laughs> There's a couple of reasons. There's a slide I don't show. Um, so remember I said that we have these different terms that we've been using? About in uh, about 1998, a bunch of researchers and clinicians came together and they said, if we're really gonna understand grief, if we're really gonna understand what gets problematic in grief, we have to come up with a list of criteria we could use to determine are we all talking about the same thing or not? And this became diagnostic criteria. But it turns out we've been doing research on it since 1998, and those criteria have changed a little bit over time. And so what we know now is that when I do a grief study and I put out a flyer that says, have you experienced the death of a loved one? The people who come to me are often the people who have a lot of grief. People who don't have a lot of grief think, well, that study is probably not for me. So in many of our research studies, we actually see higher levels of chronic grief or prolonged grief. But when we do what we call random sampling, where we simply randomly call people, say, all in one neighborhood or all in one township, then we can get more accurate levels of the prolonged grief disorder by using the same criteria, but by having no barrier to entry, so to speak, so that we're actually evaluating everyone. And so the 10%, or possibly even a little bit smaller, um, is on average when randomly sampling. We know there are a couple of situations that increase the chances of prolonged grief disorder, um, and that is things like uh, the death of a spouse or the death of a child. But that isn't, you know, absolute. We just know those are sort of risk factors. So I think it's the difference between the sampling method that leads to those differences. Great catch. We have a question over here. Oh, we have a question here. The man with the mic can actually see people. Um, do any of your studies show cognitive dysfunction in people that have experienced um, either multiple episodes, multiple deaths, or, uh, you know, severe grief? Great question about cognitive deficits. I'd say this happens in two different ways. One is that most of us experience concentration difficulties after the death of a loved one. I think of this as sort of, it's sort of like, you know, when your computer is updating in the background and you're trying to work on a Word document and your Word document is like really slowed down. 
your brain is trying to update what the heck is going on here. And so your ability to concentrate on the task at hand is often very distracted and very difficult. Um, so that's actually pretty common and also resolves pretty naturally. There's no kind of intervention needed for that. There's two other ways to think about this. One is that we often see in people who've been experiencing mild cognitive decline that the death of a spouse can be sort of a turning point where then there's a more severe change in the cognitive decline. You know, for many of us, we don't think about it, but we sort of outsource our memory to our spouse, for example. <laughs> I do this all the time. Honey, which red wine do I like, right? So when that person then isn't there, we suddenly have to function at a much higher level because we don't have them to rely on. So if there has been decline, sometimes we then see a drop. But there's another thing that you might be pointing to which I think is very interesting and very important. And that is, you know, I told you about all those hormones that change when we lose a loved one. And one of those, of course, is cortisol, that stress hormone that we get. We know that stress hormones like cortisol impact our hippocampus and, pro and other parts of the brain as well. And that impacts our cognitive function. We see that there can be kind of a repeated hits issue where, as you said, when there have been multiple losses, we often see that there are changes that we're not seeing in people who aren't experiencing such severe grief. There are very few of these studies, and they're not perfect in the chicken or egg kind of department yet. Was the problem there already, and that made it hard to grieve? Or was it the grief that made the cognitive decline? So the jury's still a little bit out on that. But the thing that it also makes me note is, it sounds strange, but you know, bereavement is a health disparity. If we're going to say that mortality rates are higher in minoritized communities, what that means is that people are experiencing more losses, losses younger in their life, and potentially losses that have a really big impact financially or in terms of caregiving. And so one of the things that I'm very interested in um, from some other research that's been done on health when people from, um, say, the black community experience multiple losses is that it may be that under these conditions where people are having a very different experience because of the multiple losses that we might actually see changes in the brain that are unique. And so I think this is a really important area for, for future research. Yeah. I'll let the man with the mic decide. <laughs> You've been talking about feelings, basically, but do you, any of your subjects have what they think are physical manifestations? You know, constant yeah. GI problems, headaches, heart palpitations, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's a great question. So, I, you know, I've been talking about from here up, <laughs> but it turns out that, you know, your body doesn't know that neurology is a separate department. And so it's absolutely the case. All of those hormones that I'm talking about, of course, they're affecting the body as well. And so the experience that most people have of not being able to sleep and not being able to eat is because of the, of the cortisol and the adrenaline that people are experiencing. And it's those same hormones that are actually causing, in many people, I would go so far as to say, in most people, a slight increase in blood pressure in the first six months. And it's that kind of increase in blood pressure that is possibly the kind of mechanism we see with the broken heart phenomena. So the broken heart phenomena, so for example, for a man whose wife dies, in the next six months, he is twice as likely to die as a married man of similar age and health and so forth. That's a, pretty that's a pretty remarkable risk factor that changes. And so the ones that you mentioned, we know that, they're, that the immune system is also being affected, that the GI tract is being affected. Um, and so, it, yes, we do commonly hear about physical symptoms as well. <laughs> 
Thank you. So you're saying, I think, that any kind of loss mm -hmm. could trigger the grief. Uh, war, loss of a home, uh, in a flood, uh, anything. It's a great question and a, and a really common question that I get. So let me tell you how I think about it. Again, I won't say that there's definitive scientific evidence, but having read a lot of grief studies, this is how I think about it. Remember going back to that bond. There had to be something that existed first, right? And so with the death of a loved one, you have that bond gets broken. Now, we know that bonds actually get broken for lots of reasons, not just the death of a loved one, right? Divorce, the empty nest, being estranged, um, moving, I could go on and on, right? There are lots of reasons that a bond might get broken, and I think that that probably works very similarly in the neurobiology of attachment. But here's what also happens. If you think about that bonded relationship, which I think had a very evolutionary reason why our brain had to figure out how to do that, how to grieve and understand that this person is gone, if I use the, so I use the word daughter to describe myself, but the word daughter, it actually implies two people, doesn't it? Right? The word spouse implies two people. The word best friend implies two people. And so I think that what we are coming to understand is that with the death of a loved one, we lose a piece of ourself. You know, am I a parent if my child has died? How is it different to be a widow than to be a married person? We're dealing with a loss of we. The reason this is relevant is now I think about other types of losses. Let's say you retire or you lose your job. Professor is pretty closely, you know, it's how I function in the world. It's a part of my identity. And if I lose that, I think it's a very similar thing. You've lost a part of yourself, of the way you function in the world. And so I think while it's not a bond that gets broken, I think that the brain understands, oh, this is a similar experience of losing something about myself that I have to learn how to be in the world loss of safety, loss of health, loss of function, all sorts of losses. Now I have to learn how to be in the world again in this different way. And so I think that is why the grief is there in those other circumstances. Yeah. Okay. It is 7.30 and I just, I was told that I should let you all go at 7.30. I am gonna be in the uh, foyer and, and if any of you brought books that you would like to have signed, I brought a Sharpie. So <laughs> I can meet any of you out there that would like that. Thank you very much.